excerpt from that. And we uh, um, we uh, hope to get uh, get to start running it annually again uh, uh, this year, and uh, uh, we'll have some information at the end uh, on uh, where you can sign up for that again. Um, the the idea of the observing labs is that um, we present some information on an astronomical topic, um, uh, but we keep the talking down to a minimum so that you can spend more time at the telescopes and we bring our docents out. Um, it's a very small group, so um, uh, you get a lot of time at the telescope um, uh, talking with uh, docents who are uh, knowledgeable about the objects that you're going to see, and you get to interact with those at the eyepieces and at the imagers uh, that we have here at the RFO. So we're just going to we're going to present the information tonight about how stars quote unquote die. Um, and you'll learn more about that as, why, as I go here, but, um, uh, but be sure to look out for that opportunity in September to come out. Um, the, uh, the, we start off with just uh, uh, talking about stars. And, and of course, you, you've all looked up in the sky and seen stars every night. Um, if you're not living in a big city, like I do in San Francisco, where um, I can see maybe one or two stars if I'm lucky. Um, these uh, stars, these, uh, these lights, these pinpricks of light are huge balls of gas, big balls of gas, and uh, lots and lots of, uh, of matter um, uh, in those balls of gas. Um, they are capable of sustained nuclear fusion, so at the cores that's going on, um, but they've got these big uh, gaseous atmospheres that get heated up by all of the energy that's produced in those cores. And you're basically, um, uh, they're fighting the, the gravity of all of that mass trying to crush that core and the nuclear fusion in the center of that star that's pushing against that gravity and they reach an equilibrium. Um, most of these uh, stars spend their nuclear fusion life in what's called the main sequence. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, uh, in the middle of the talk, um, but that's uh, fusing the smallest atoms, hydrogen, into the next smallest item, uh, atoms, uh, helium. And eventually more massive stars begin fusing the helium into even larger atoms, uh, into carbon and oxygen. Um, and as they go, it gets hotter and hotter. There's more energy being produced um, in the center of those stars. And because the change of that energy is being is pushing against gravity and that balance changes, it changes the form. In some cases, they become uh, giant stars. Once the energy gets very going pretty well inside that fusion, it pushes the outer envelope, that atmosphere out, and the star grows in its size um, into giants or supergiant stars. Um, but because they're pushing out to a larger volume, the temperature drops. And so they actually become cooler as to our eye, even though the core of the star is hotter. The, the most rare stars are the most massive ones, as you'll see, and they fuse carbon and oxygen into even heavier elements um, until they get to iron. And that's the end of the road. And we'll talk a little bit about that eventually the star reaches the end of nuclear fusion. It runs out of fuel, essentially. And, and that is what we're talking about when we talk about the death of a star. Um, if it's not doing nuclear fusion um, like it was in most of its life, then it's uh, not really um, uh, alive as a star, all in quotes here. So, if we're going to talk about star death, we also need to talk a little bit about the beginnings of stars and how stars form. And uh, the stars uh, um, and, and these other massive objects, some of them are not quite stars. Um, they all condense out of these clouds of gas and dust. And what you're looking at here is uh, our, the Eagle, is the Eagle Nebula. Um, and uh, on the left side, you can see the really dark uh, part in there. And one of the things that you learn as you start to look at the sky and through a telescope <clears throat> is that anytime you see something dark in the sky where there's no stars, it means something's blocking your view. And so what we're looking at is dust um, and uh, matter that is not glowing. Um, when you take a close-up of that um, in the Hubble Space Telescope, you see what you see on the right. 
And here you can see these pillars, these gaseous pillars as they were named, um, that are um, collections of that gas. And they're starting to be lit up by nearby stars. Um, the stars inside those are eventually going to collapse. Um, but they, uh, um, right now they're just being lit up by stars in their neighborhood. So when we start looking at the objects that start to form by the collapse of this gas and dust into these stars, um, the most numerous objects that we find out there are the lowest mass ones. And these are um, gas giant planets and planetary mass objects, uh, meaning they're about the, the mass of a planet here in our solar system up to Jupiter size. Um, they're a, a, about a hundredth the sun's mass and they usually end up orbiting other stars. Um, and they're expected to be the most common. This is a theory. Um, and it's uh, it, because they're hard to find. We, we haven't found that many of them. Um, although now with about 5,000 exoplanets, we know that the planetary uh, scale masses are, are at least common in, in almost every solar system. But the, the, as we go up the scale in mass, um, we get a, few, a somewhat fewer number of, of stars here. This is the next step is to brown dwarfs. Here we're going to from a hundredth to about eight hundredths of the sun's mass. So still not quite enough. Um, in some cases, there may be a little bit of hydrogen to helium in the core being uh, fused, but then it stops and it only lasts for 10 million years or so. And that's not very long on astronomical scales. So it doesn't last for very long. And, uh, and then they just cool off and uh, become cold, dark balls. And, uh, um, and, uh, and not, not, uh, we, we do see some of these out there, but uh, there's, uh, there's not so many to see just because they're, they're kind of dark and hard to, hard to find. Um, red dwarfs and white dwarfs, um, and this is an image of white dwarfs. On the left, you're seeing uh, what's called a globular cluster, really beautiful in this telescopes up at RFO. Um, and uh, it looks like a, 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 a sugar spilled on a, a background of black velvet. Um, but when you zoom in, that little circle on the, on the uh, left is uh, um, blown up into this image on the right. And, in the little circles in here, not the bright ones, but the little circles are the white dwarfs. So you can see they're quite, quite faint. Um, and these are getting up to about a third of the sun's mass. Um, they're less common again than the brown dwarfs. Um, but um, when we talk about stars, because brown dwarfs are not quite stars, um, uh, these are the most common. And uh, quite dim, as I was saying, now they're uh, capable of fu uh, fusing all of the isotopes of hydrogen. So, and they do some hydrogen to helium, um, but uh, because they um, have so little fuel, they burn it very, very slowly. And so they actually will burn for trillions of years. At least we think that's true from our models. Um, and because uh, we haven't been around long enough to uh, see trillion year old stars. In the, um, the next stage is the intermediate mass stars, and that's where our sun falls in. Um, and it includes stars that are anywhere from about a third of our sun's mass up to about eight times our sun's mass. And uh, um, uh, about one in 10, where we, we have, a, if you count the number of red dwarfs and white dwarfs, the com combination, about a 10th of those, of those stars, we have about a 10th of that population are sun-like stars. Um, and they will last for billions of years. Um, and they do fuse hydrogen into helium and then to carbon and then to oxygen for the last few hundred millions of years. And we'll talk a little bit about um, where they go from there. This is, uh, um, they can go into this orange giant phase or the red giant phase, which just means that the, the core is, press, it is uh, heating up more as it gets into the carbon and oxygen fusing and pushing that outer envelope out. And so they become very large stars. Our, our sun is gonna do that. You've probably seen programs, Cosmos and other programs that predict that in a few, about 5 billion years, our sun is gonna grow in size so that um, the orbit of earth is inside the atmosphere of our sun. I won't be very comfortable at that point. Um, 
of all through this time, uh, pulsations and very strong solar winds, um, just like the ones we see now, except that they're, they're even stronger, are pushing the atmosphere of the star out into surrounding space. At first, just, just bits and pieces of it. And as you'll see, um, more and more of it as they uh, get closer to the end of their, their uh, stellar lives. And the core, because it's uh, becoming uh, more um, uh, massive uh, atoms in there as the fuse is also becoming denser. Um, so to the point where about um, half of the sun's mass is about the, in a space about the size of the earth. So it's uh, crushed in there. And then um, at the end, the fusion ends and, and it leaves behind a white dwarf and um, for a while, a planetary nebula. And that's, that's one of the things that is uh, easy for us to see in our telescopes um, at RFO um, to uh, take a look at and uh, some very beautiful objects. The high mass stars, we'll keep going into the, 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 uh, the more and more massive stars. Um, uh, these are um, about eight to a hundred times the sun's mass. So these are getting into what's classed as massive and supermassive stars. And um, they are also the rarest of the stars. So about one out of every hundred uh, compared to the sun-like stars. And they're capable of uh, fusing carbon and oxygen all the way to the most heavy elements, um, including iron. Um, <clears throat> they're very energetic and luminous um, and they don't last long because they are using their fuel up so quickly. Um, they are only sustaining the fusion of hydrogen to helium for millions of years, not billions, just so it's very short from a, uh, a stellar lifetime point of view. Um, and if they get to iron, then they are going to say they're, they're going to get to the point where they uh, go through this red giant phase, similar to the solar, the, the solar sized stars, lots of pulsations, instabilities, um, the, <clears throat> the planetary nebulas that we see here, and then the, the star loses much of its mass into space. And what we're seeing here is what happens if the star is uh, reaches the point where it explodes in a supernova. Um, this is the type of supernova that explodes just from the mass of the initial starting um, uh, gas and dust that collapsed from that cloud. And the core usually becomes something very small, a, ne a neutron star, or even more rarely, um, the core of the most massive stars can uh, collapse into a black hole. And what we're seeing here in the images um, on the left is the remains of, of, a, of a star that's been, that's thrown its atmosphere out um, after a supernova. And, uh, um, and on the right side, there's uh, an image of, uh, of a star that's uh, a planetary nebula that's in the process of slowly, more slowly pushing out um, its atmosphere out around that star. So we're going to take a, a quick trip here through um, uh, a part of the, uh, the, our, our understanding of how stars um, uh, uh, evolve through their lifetimes and how they grow up in their own uh, the clusters. Because as you can imagine, if you've got a dust cloud out there, the dust clouds are huge. And so the, the, the dust cloud doesn't collapse just into one star. That would be way too organized. Um, instead, um, multiple stars are going to collapse. And, and what we see is that the, the uh, um, I'm, I'm going to point out a little bit about what these, um, um, these charts are showing you, these color diagrams. Um, each one of them is the same structure here. And it's showing you the color from left to right. And the color corresponds to the temperature of the star. And from the left, we're going from the hottest um, and, uh, and to the right, the coolest. The O, B, A, F, G, K, M uh, 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 letters are letters that were assigned in alphabetical order at first, but then they realized that they were in those classifications that they were in a different order for the temperature. And so they're in that temperature order right here. And then the, on, the, on the vertical axis, you have the magnitude or the brightness. Um, 
from the um, the very brightest at the top to the uh, the dimmest at the bottom. And so on that on that this uh, the first stars in the first few uh, thousands and millions of years are whoops, I'm going to go back if I can. Let me. Oh, I did, I did go back. Um, sorry about that. Um, the first stars are up in the upper left up there. So they're the hottest and they're the brightest stars. And the biggest stars are the ones that form first. Um, the very young cluster has just massive stars and, um, and they start up there on that uh, top left area. Each one of those dots in that graph is uh, representing um, a star or a, a collection of stars in that size. Um, as you go down to this, the lower row of these stars, they the massive stars you can see start evolving quickly. And you can see the arrow in the left-hand one that is uh, pointing out this star is left that main sequence um, where hydrogen is burned and it's starting to cool off. So as it moves to the right, it's cooling off and uh, um, it's uh, losing that temperature. And, uh, um, and that's uh, even in 12 million years, they're the biggest stars are already moving off in those, uh, those pieces. And, uh, and a lot of our star uh, formation models come from studying clusters where we can see a snapshot of many different stars at different ages as they go through this evolution in the cluster. Here you can see that we've got um, the 500 million age. Here I did it again. I'm going to go back if I can. Let's go back. Give me a moment. There we go. So here at 500 million years, the uh, the more and more stars are moving off to the um, to the right here and cooling off of the main sequence, and they're they're coming from a lower temperature as well and a lower brightness uh, on here. So they um, they are leaving less massive stars on the main okay. sequence. And George, I can't stop. see your slide. Stop Ooh. screen sharing. Uh, that's well, what that You need some IT help, <laughs> Thank right? Thank you. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> Thanks, Ralph. There we go. Thanks for interrupting me. Um, so this is uh, showing these stars moving off to the right up here. And uh, um, this these arrows are marking where the cutoff point is so that you, you don't find stars anymore up on the upper parts of the curve, only on the lower parts. And that turns out to be a way to judge the age of the cluster because you could, we've seen after, after looking through a number of clusters, the uh, astronomers have, that um, these um, um, uh, clusters behave in very similar ways. And uh, so you, doing the statistics on those, you can get to this point. So now here um, we see um, the F stars and it are starting, we're at a half cutoff point after about 2 billion years. Now, here in the uh, this bottom left uh, graph, you can see that G is about the, the level of where the, the cluster is at. And our star is a G star, <clears throat> an ordinary G star. And uh, it's, uh, um, uh, we're out about 5 billion years in our cluster's life. Our star is about 5 billion years old, and uh, this is uh, roughly about 7 billion stars in uh, uh, 7 billion years in the cluster's life. And out at 14 billion years, even the cooler stars are now the ones that are leaving the, the, uh, the main sequence. And so, um, and one of the things that is happening here in 7 billion years, I wanted to point out, is that planetary nebula are starting to show up. And so that's uh, one of the more interesting things for us to see in our small telescopes, and that's what we're going to talk about next. So planetary nebula, the first of all, the name. <laughs> these, these are not planets. They don't have anything to do with planets. Um, and, uh, but what they got that name 
because the small telescopes that um, the early astronomers used when they saw these, they looked like um, the balls with atmospheres because um, they were they were fuzzy at the edges, and uh, and so they they called them planetary nebulae. They realized pretty quickly that they were clouds um, or nebulae. But they called everything that wasn't a star a nebulae in the early days. Um, this is the Helix Nebula in Aquarius. And these are <coughs> looking like a disk in uh, telescopes. And uh, the, uh, the gas that you can see is uh, this, this shaped gas that uh, makes this uh, ring here is all being put out by this star in the center. And you can see that that um, central white dwarf, it's, it's very hot. Um, in, by comparison, the surface of our star is about 5,000 degrees centigrade, and these are 100,000 to 300,000 degrees centigrade, in part because what we're seeing is almost the naked core of the star. There's almost uh, no atmosphere left there because it's all been pushed out and it's been slowly expanding and growing um, outside of that, that's, that's, that star and pushing out into the neighborhood. Um, it radiates lots of high energy um, UV, the star, the star does, ultraviolet, and even some x-ray light, <clears throat> and that excites the surrounding gas. So that's heating up the gas, as you will, um, and uh, causing it to glow. The, uh, the planetary nebula, and by the way, this one is the snowball nebula, um, and uh, it's uh, definitely got a nice green tinge in here. Um, so this is a uh, it's, and it's in the, uh, uh, this blue snowball nebula is in the constellation of Andromeda. George, somebody asked, is this planetary nebula also called the eye of God? I have heard it called that, um, and, uh, but I prefer the blue snowball. <laughs> so, but thanks. Um, the, uh, uh, but it is, it is the same one. Um, and most uh, PNs, planetary nebulas for short, um, do look a little greenish or blue green, mostly, and that's due to the oxygen, um, oxygen three um, light emission. So as the, as the that inner dwarf is um, uh, irradiating the gas, um, it heats up the um, electrons around a, um, uh, uh, an oxygen atom and raises them to a higher energy level. And then when they drop back down in the quantum uh, event, back down into their regular level, there's, uh, there are, they can go different levels there, but this particular oxygen three level emits light in this uh, lovely green color. Um, and uh, um, invisible light, this, the central white dwarf, it's usually about half as bright as the sun, absolute brightness we're talking about. Um, and uh, um, the nebula itself is brighter, much brighter. And as you saw in the Helix Nebula, um, the, the nebula is, is much brighter than the actual white dwarf as it's seeing in there. Um, interestingly enough, these nebula, <clears throat> as you might imagine, don't last very long. Um, and uh, it, on our lifetime scales, it's a, a few 10,000s of years. So um, they, they're around while we're looking at them. But um, <clears throat> This they in in terms of astronomical time scales, they they appear and they're gone uh, very quickly, and so when we look at a whole population of stars, that's why we don't see planetary nebula everywhere, um, because uh, the the you know stars have been around long enough for those ne those nebulae to have formed um, in this death process of the star. Almost every star goes through this process, and so that we would see planetary nebula everywhere if they uh, stayed long. So we know that they, they do go away in, in about 10,000 years. Um, and then very, very slowly on the inside there, that, that white dwarf over um, uh, probably more than millions of years, I think that's a typo here, should be billions of years, they, uh, they uh, go dark. And, uh, um, and so on average right now from surveys that have been done, um, uh, one planetary nebula gets formed in the Milky Way each year. So um, I, I, have, I, I don't know that anybody announces when they found the new one, but uh, um, it'd be fun to see what new planetary nebula get discovered. Uh, there's a little bit, I'm gonna give you a link at the end uh, for some current research on planetary nebula. 
George, um, in the uh, somebody asked in the planetary nebula view, it looks almost two dimensional. Is the gaseous ring spherical, and are we merely looking through that portion that is closest to us? I love this question uh, because it's a great segue. I'm going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. But they are three dimensional objects. And, uh, and the question is, what three-dimensional object? What do they actually look like? Um, and that's, a, that's an active uh, um, research topic uh, uh, amongst professional astronomers. Um, this is uh, one of the favorites. Um, it's e very easy to find in a small telescope, M57. M M I haven't talked about the M numbers. Uh, for those of you new to them, they, uh, they refer to Messier. Uh, Charles Messier was an astronomer looking for comets. And uh, he, would find, he found the M57. And uh, um, this looked like a comet to him because it's fuzzy. Um, and uh, then he watched it. It didn't move. And he said, dang, not a comet. Let me put this on my list. And he made a list of about 100 of these objects. And, uh, and uh, others have added to it as well. And uh, that Messier object list uh, turns out to be a great list of objects for small telescopes to look at. This one is, uh, in the, is seen as uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and, uh, and we've taken images in the, uh, the 20 inch telescope uh, that uh, when you add the color images together and get enough of them together, um, can uh, not quite rival the Hubble, but uh, you do get a good view and recognize the, uh, the ring nebula in all its uh, color glory. Um, in the center, and the color, speaking of the colors, the center is blue. And, um, and of course, uh, the space behind it is completely black, so that has to be gas there. And, um, and from uh, spectroscopic studies, we know that that's helium. Um, and then further out, you see green for the oxygen and the nitrogen. And then the furthest out is from hydrogen. Now, it's not really well understood why the, it seems like the, um, the, the elements are segregated like that in the structure of the planetary nebula. And they're segregated in very different ways from one, um, one nebula to another. Um, but they, um, they have very complex uh, geometries and um, they're still, uh, still actively researching and working to try and understand what they look like. So this is, um, this is starting to get into this, the question that you asked about um, the structure of these uh, planetary nebulae. Um, this is uh, a, a new general catalog or NGC 3132 um, in the constellation of Vela. Um, and, um, and you can see at the center, the white dwarf as usual, and then a very different kind of nebula around it. And um, there's two different uh, interpretations of what we're looking at here. Um, it, it could be that as we go from one planetary nebula to the next, we are looking at um, different projections or looking at a, a different um, at a different angle at very similar structures. Or it could be that these planetary nebula are in different evolutionary stages. Remember that when we, when we are doing astronomy, because stars ages, stars evolve so much slower, more slowly than our lives go by a blink. Um, uh, we are just seeing a snapshot of a population as if we were taking a snapshot in downtown San Francisco and we saw um, uh, people of all ages there <clears throat> and we could infer what the lifetime of humans is from looking at that snapshot. So by studying the, the spectrum, the colors of the ionized elements, um, it, it, uh, it doesn't seem possible to tell what part of the observation is related to the shape. Uh, we can't predict what parts of the nebula are gonna be ionized because we don't know why certain elements are in the center and why certain elements are on the edge. Um, but uh, you can also do Doppler studies of these. In other words, what what velocity this, the, uh, the gases are moving in each one with some careful work with the spectroscope. And uh, what they found was that um, by studying the light of oxygen and nitrogen, that they can't match it to an ellipsoid state, like a sphere or um, you know, a flattened ellipsoid shape. Um, and what they're finding is that it looks like the shape is matched to um, this Diablo's page, and I touched the mouse again. I have to quit doing that. 
How do I go back, Ralph? I'm looking. Yeah, I can see it here. There we go. Got it. <laughs> so this uh, the shape on the right is the um, Diablo model. Um, it's the, also an alternate name for the dumbbell. And so you can see that it's got um, uh, sort of two cups back to back each other. If you took uh, two teacups without their handles and put the bases together, <clears throat> that's the shape you would get. And so we think we're looking at that shape from a certain angle and that you can see the center of the star in the middle of that. And then the cast is distributed around it. And, um, and the shape is, uh, is being created by, that, uh, um, by that, that angle and the particular um, structure or morphology of, of that uh, planetary nebula. So this is uh, the, one of the studies uh, has looked at that. These are some other ideas, uh, uh, other studies that have been done on, uh, first of all, the Ant Nebula. Um, and, uh, and what we're looking at here are ways to use the spectral lines, again, with the, the Doppler effect, to um, do something like a, a tomographic um, image, um, which is similar to what happens when they do a CAT scan, where they they uh, put uh, radiation through your body and, uh, um, and, and basically are building up an image slice by slice as they go through um, your body. They do, they do the same thing with these planetary nebulas and <clears throat> generate 3D models of them. So it's a little hard to see here. Um, in, the, in the middle image, this is the, um, the Saturn nebula. And um, it's... Uh, um, it, it, they're, they're slowly going through and uh, each image is a different slice through the planetary nebula and um, are using that to build up a 3D model. Um, and the bottom image is, um, is uh, trying to show how that model will look. And, and now we can actually see those models. They can be put into even uh, something like our uh, PCs and rotate it around. So this is a 3D movie that we'll play a couple of times and uh, let you see that um, there is a central object that looks like a star. Let me see if I can get it to play again here. And, uh, um, and it's elongated. Um, it doesn't look like that Diablo object at the, uh, for the most part, but if you take a look, you get a little bit of that if you look at the left end of it and the right end of it, the two ends of it, you can see a little bit of the cup shape on either end, but there's also a, quite a cloud inside that is uh, uh, showing up um, as uh, just sort of a, an expanding cloud around the star, which you, it, you know it has to start that way as they go through. So building these 3D models makes it much easier for us to visualize and understand what we might be looking at. And, uh, um, and I haven't seen very many more of these out there in the world, but it'd be interesting to, to uh, keep an eye out for those uh, in the, uh, the, the scientific papers on the topic. Another way that we can tell what uh, the, the, is going on in these planetary nebula are the, um, by taking images um, at different exposures. And so these, are the, these three images are taken at the same image scale. This is not zooming in on M57, the ring nebula. They're black and white. So they are not showing all the colors in this case. But on the left, you could see, see a relatively short um, exposure and the images uh, is just uh, the, uh, that size, it's that size in the middle and that's the ring that we normally see, the size of the ring. If we take a longer exposure, you can start to see, well, the center is completely overexposed because it's much brighter, but you can see the fainter parts of the cloud um, outside of the ring structure that we normally see. And you can see both the, um, uh, these, these structures that are complex uh, um, uh, uh, clouds coming out of that star, and then a bigger structure, a big bubble you may be able to see going all the way around the outside of it. And then when you take an even longer exposure, you can see that this has got um, uh, gas all the way out to the edges of the, of the image. And uh, so the planetary nebula has an effect way outside of that central star inside of the ring nebula. 
And <clears throat> this is uh, um, probably that same kind of hourglass structure that just a guess of the, um, uh, from the studies that we've done so far, or astronomers have done um, as the dumbbell nebula that we were seeing earlier. And that this ring part is right at the center part of it. It's the, it's the sort of the narrow center part of the hourglass. If you were gonna turn it up on its, uh, on its end and run sand through it, that's the place where the sand would be going through. So um, planetary nebula for small telescopes, this is a short list of uh, um, objects that you can see in a small telescope. I'm talking about um, even a, in a refractor size, a, a three inch telescope, a four inch telescope, or in a six to eight inch reflector. Um, these are popular objects to go looking for and to find in uh, those kinds of instruments. And, and if you were to come to an, uh, an observing lab, um, you would definitely get to see these objects. And then um, there are some challenging um, uh, planetary nebulas um, for astrophotographers. Now, you can see some of these in the telescope um, with your eye, but um, they are, they're faint objects. Um, and uh, as, you, as you get experience in looking through a telescope, um, and as your eye dark adapts better and better and you learn tricks like uh, looking just to the side of what you're looking at so that the more sensitive part of your eye um, is uh, in, in the focal plane for the object, you see more. And, uh, and the longer you look, the more you see. Um, and so you can see these objects, but um, the real, uh, you get the best images of these through imaging. And so um, astrophotography using the new digital imagers um, in 60 seconds, you can get quite a beautiful image of these um, in, the, uh, and in the, uh, um, the way that we use imaging in our telescope on the, the, the Ritchie Christian 20 inch. Um, we add the different colors in individually. We take it with a filter three different images and then add them in software to create a color image um, to uh, get, get some of the beautiful uh, colors from these nebulas. So back to white dwarfs, <clears throat> the cores, the, the, store, the stars that have lasted, outlasted their their, uh, their fuel and are starting to cool off. Um, <clears throat> they are, um, as we said, they're very massive in the center, very dense objects. And uh, the mass density is about 10 tons per cubic centimeter, um, a sugar cube size. And um, they're composed primarily of carbon and oxygen in this stage, um, but it's weird carbon and oxygen. Um, the electrons are all degenerate. They're in a they're in a massive lowest energy. They're not really associated with the atoms anymore. The the, the, the nucleuses, and uh, they're just in a, this massive soup, and uh, it's sort of like a super metallic super crystal. The 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 electrons move very easily inside of that, and uh, um, they can be formed um, either starting with red dwarfs that are composed of helium, but um, they they also um, end up with this carbon and oxygen uh, if they're a little bit larger. Um, when we move up to the massive or supermassive stars after having shed their planetary nebula, this is a, an example of one uh, called Antares, which is the brightest star in Scorpius. And um, the star, this is right in the Milky Way. So you see th thousands, millions of stars in this image. Um, but you can see here's Antares um, um, at my cursor. And this is a red supergiant star. And soon, well, it says soon here, but uh, we're talking about astronomically soon, you know, so not tomorrow. Um, it's gonna, it's going to supernova. It's big enough to supernova. And so, um, uh, you know, it could go anytime. We think Betelgeuse is another one of those stars in Orion. Um, and uh, these stars vary in size. The star varies in size from about the uh, Earth orbit size to Neptune orbit, not the, not the Earth size, but out to our orbit in size and out to Neptune's orbit in size. So they're huge. Um, but most of the mass is in that core, like I said before. And uh, when you go out into the atmosphere, um, uh, the, it's, uh, it's similar in density to a laboratory vacuum. So 
uh, you know, this is it's a, a it's an interesting thought experiment to understand what it would be like to be a planet inside of a stellar atmosphere like that. I think uh, more of the the detrimental effects of that uh, that star coming out is going to be the radiation that was going to be flying through there um, than the mass that it might be running into. But it would definitely slow the planet down, and, and who knows, you may have some planets slowed enough down so that they spiral into the star. But notice here that um, the star is has a big red nebula around it here. Um, and uh, that's uh, part of the planetary, pro planetary nebula process of expelling gas from the center of the star. So super giant stars for the small telescopes, Antares and Aldebaran and Betelgeuse. And Betelgeuse has been in the news for the last couple of years because it's been variable. It's been changing a lot. Um, compared to um, uh, its normal um, brightness. And so there's lots of speculation about what's going on there and is it, is it getting ready to go? And uh, so it will be interesting to, to see what happens. That's, that's a pretty close star. Any of the brightest stars that we see in our sky are relatively close to us in the galaxy. They're in, they maybe even came from our, our local cluster um, that our sun was formed in, and uh, that will that would be a very close super supernova event. So something that um, I'm not sure it would be a great experience for us to be here, given the gamma rays that come off of something like that, and the neutrinos, and the, the uh, all of the other radiation. So um, supernovae are. Um, are exploding stars. Our stars uh, get to a point where they can no longer because iron is the is it's formed enough iron in the core from the fusion process that the that the, the when iron when you try to fuse iron into the next heavier element it actually consumes energy and so rather than producing energy with fusion which is what has been holding this massive atmosphere of this star up um, it starts to collapse and it does it very quickly um, and uh, and it that supernova is what is what we see when it happens and when it does it it goes from about earth size um, in the core to about 12 miles wide so think about something 9,000 miles in diameter down to 12 miles in less than a second so it's just coming together bam and then um, it rebounds out and blows off a lot of the atmosphere the outer part of the star out um, out of that Meanwhile, it's putting out about a hundred suns of their, uh, the, the energy of a hundred suns over the entire 10 billion years of their lives, um, all in that instant. So they're actually brighter than the galaxies that they're in, if we're looking at a supernova in a distant galaxy. Uh, and most of that energy is released as massless neutrinos. Um, uh, but there's plenty of other radiation coming out of there as well. And uh, that um, uh, during that explosion, iron is then finally fused because in that moment, it doesn't matter that it takes more energy. There's just so much potential energy in the gravity that crashes and crushes that core and it crushes it into all of the heavier elements than iron. So gold and platinum and all of the the rare earths that uh, go up uh, heavier than iron, every one of those uh, elements is formed in a supernova. And there's no other way for those uh, elements to be formed in the universe. So they've all come, all those elements that we have here on earth come from that process. And, and of course that shock wave is pushing all of that, that uh, gas out. And we, we haven't seen a, uh, supernovas in our galaxy, one in the, the, one of our nearby galaxies, the Magellanic Clouds, and in other galaxies. Um, but uh, they do leave uh, these glowing uh, remnant nebulas, and that's what we go to look for in our smaller telescopes. So the remnants of those explosions could be um, a couple of different uh, uh, destinations. They could become neutron stars. And uh, these are stars that are around uh, one to three times the mass of the sun. Um, and they're about 12 miles across, as I said. Um, the de density now is tens of billions of tons per cubic centimeter. So um, uh, this uh, image on the left is uh, 
showing you Manhattan down here, if you recognize it, and the size of the star in comparison to Manhattan. Um, the entire mass is neutrons. The, the protons and electrons have been pushed together so hard that uh, there's, they can no longer exist <coughs> as separate uh, uh, particles and they, uh, they end up as neutrons. And the mass is so concentrated there um, that um, the escape velocity to get off of the surface of the star, if uh, there was such a thing, um, is about a third of the speed of light. Um, so lots of space-time warping going on there. And uh, the, if you were an observer on the surface, you would see yourself at the bottom of a bowl. I don't even, I'm not even sure how to tell you what that would look like. But, um, and there are strong, there can be very strong magnetic fields in these uh, stars. And so if they're spinning, um, which many of them are, um, they can create a very precise, regular pulse as the magnetic field is um, uh, whipping its way through the matter um, uh, right around it. And it uh, uh, causes radio waves to be emitted in a particular direction. And when that, uh, that uh, rotation brings that direction around a point at Earth, our radio telescopes can observe that as a pulse. And some of these pulse pulses uh, are, are as fast as a thousand times per second. Um, and, uh, and so they've gotten that name pulsars from that. The first pulsar that was observed um, through a radio telescope uh, um, was thought it was thought it might be a communication from uh, a, 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 an intelligent civilization um, because it's so unusual. But uh, eventually, we we understood that this is just the natural evolution of stars of a certain mass. Stellar black holes are the the last uh, destination that a star could get to, and they are the least common. Um, and they're the densest of all. And they are so dense that we don't have a way to measure the density um, and nothing can escape them. Uh, they're uh, not even light. Um, so you know a lot about stellar black holes because there's so many movies. Um, Interstellar is one of my favorites. Um, and uh, the, uh, they, they generally have at least a mass of about uh, eight, uh, eight uh, solar masses and they can be much bigger than that. And uh, the event horizon, uh, it, nobody knows how, what the object is inside, but the event horizon where we can't see anything else inside of that um, is, uh, um, is about 10 miles wide. But, I, uh, but I, this is theoretical. Nobody's actually imaged a black hole, um, although there's some, been some good attempts at the central, like huge black hole at the center of our galaxy with the event horizon telescope. Um, and uh, those, uh, those gravitational forces have overwhelmed all the forces that hold the subatomic particles and the neutrons together. So they, um, they, uh, they're just smashed into this unimaginably small space. Um, now, around the black hole, especially at places like the centers of galaxies, uh, but there are special cases, not even these stellar black holes, you can have energetic accretion disks. Basically, matter is falling into these from whatever the remnants of the dust cloud that they formed from or the planetary system that was there. That stuff is falling and spiraling into it. It gets torn apart first, and then it slowly spirals into the black hole. And that causes a lot of energy to be jetted out of those. Um, and uh, in, uh, most often in the form of x-rays uh, is a clear signature that we're looking at a black hole. Um, uh, but uh, since we don't have X-ray telescopes, except a broken one at RFO, uh, we won't be looking at those. But we will be looking at supernova remnants. And uh, the uh, M1, the very first Messier object, is the Crab Nebula in the constellation of Taurus. And you can see it's got this, this beautiful shape, um, but a very irregular shape, but it does look like an explosion. It looks like um, something got blown to smithereens there. Um, and uh, the, uh, the nebula itself is about a thousand times brighter than the sun in absolute magnitude. And the, the nebula, it's expanding at over a thousand miles per second. So over, over time, um, astronomers have observed how it's been growing and changing, which is one of the few things that we see change in the, in the universe. 
And at the center of it is one of those pulsars, pulsars, uh, a neutron star. And, uh, and it's a, a binary uh, star, actually. Um, uh, the, the neutron star is uh, in orbit with a yellow, a yellow star, a G star like our sun. And this supernova was one that we observed in our, uh, in our galaxy in the year 1054. Um, it was observed in China and uh, in Europe as well. In China, it was called a guest star. Um, and uh, it stayed in the sky um, brighter than any other star, brighter than any planet um, um, for months until um, it dimmed enough so that they followed its, uh, uh, followed its brightness until it dimmed uh, to where it couldn't be seen anymore. And then in its place, telescopes hadn't been invented at that point. Um, but once telescopes were invented and uh, um, were good enough to start looking in these places, we found uh, the nebula, the remains of that, uh, that explosion. Another one, a very old one that we don't know where the, the center of the, the center star was, is the Cygnus Loop or the Veil Nebula in the constellation of Cygnus, which is a constellation that's high in the sky in the summer. And um, this one's about 2,600 light years away, so pretty close um, in astronomical terms, um, and believed to have formed about 15 to 40,000 years ago based on how large it is. And the fact that it survived um, so that we could still see remnants of it means that it must have been quite a massive explosion as well. Now, to give you some idea of the scale of this, um, this, this object, you can't see all of it at once in the, uh, um, in the telescopes. Um, you can look at portions of it because it's um, uh, six full moons wide in the sky. And so um, as, you're, as you're looking at it, even in low power eyepieces, you have to move around um, and uh, follow it around. But the, with telescopes up at RFO, even in smaller telescopes, you can see the brighter portions of it. And then the bigger telescopes at RFO, you can see most of the ring. You can follow it pretty much around the entire, um, the entire loop. Um, this is a, a remnant, a supernova remnant that's very hard to observe. And uh, this is, uh, these images, by the way, you can see a little bit of it uh, off to this, on the edges of the image. Um, are um, uh, are made up of a mosaic of the images, uh, um, so the, the the cameras can't take an image of the whole thing. They're taking images of smaller sections and then they're stitched together. Um, <clears throat> this is a very old uh, supernova in the the constellation of Taurus, and it's uh, uh, similar in distance um, and size uh, to the Cygnus, uh, the the Veil Nebula, or the Cygnus uh, Cygnus Loop. <clears throat> and uh, uh, about the same size, uh, instead of two and a half degrees, this one's three degrees wide. And um, it's, uh, it's almost impossible to see visually um, um, and uh, with red filters, but with photography, you can uh, get an image of this. So this is definitely a challenge object for those who uh, get some experience with this. So some of the supernova remnants for small telescopes, um, the uh, S147 is probably uh, probably should be on this list. It's a tough one to see, uh, but uh, Kepler star and Tycho star, um, both uh, supernovas uh, that uh, that were named for those early observers. Um, the Veil Nebula, of course, is uh, multiple. Looks like it's in multiple places in the sky, but when you get the big picture, you see that it was a single event. And of course, the Crab Nebula is one, uh, the first one that Messier found. And so it's easy for our small telescopes to find those too. So um, just to wrap up, uh, uh, stars end their lives uh, when the fusion ends in their cores. That's the, the quote unquote end of them. Of course, those, uh, those uh, white dwarfs and just slowly turn into a quote unquote black dwarfs uh, as they slowly um, over uh, billions of years uh, uh, end up losing the heat in there. But uh, that mass is still right there um, as the universe continues to accelerate and to expand. And, um, and the other uh, key takeaway here is that the mass of the star um, when the fusion ends determines whether they end up with a, uh, um, just a quiet uh, life at the end of their lives or they end up making a bang as they go to the end of their lives. 
And uh, the stars that are uh, near or end in our own galaxy are the ones that we can see in small telescopes. Um, but planetary nebula and black hole research is continuing. And uh, um, I will post in the chat a couple of links here for um, some ongoing planetary nebula research. Um, there are planetary nebulas now being um, identified uh, uh, in other galaxies, uh, millions of light years away. Um, so very faint, of course, very difficult to see. But um, the, the interest of the astronomers who are doing this research is to um, um, do um, the develop, develop a, a, a planetary nebula luminosity function. Now, what is that going to be used for? Um, well, the idea is to, uh, to be, because this, this planetary phase that a star goes through is so short and so common that um, they, they get, they're trying to figure out if there's a standard that they could get with how bright that is. And if they can uh, identify that standard then and know with uh, uh, some certainty what the absolute brightness of the nebula is, then they would be able to tell how far that object is away. So it's similar if some of you might be uh, familiar with Cepheid variable stars. Once we know um, what the, uh, the, the period or frequency of variation in a Cepheid star is, we know how absolutely bright it is and we can use it to tell how far um, objects are away. And that's one of the ways that we learned how far the Andromeda galaxy was away. We thought it was just a part of our, um, our galaxy and, and that data ended up telling us back in the 1930s that the Andromeda was uh, 2 million light years away. And then the other um, uh, the other place where research is happening is on planetary nebulas in uh, globular clusters. Um, um, I showed some images of, of a globular cluster demonstrating where the white dwarfs were, but um, of course, uh, stellar evolution happens in globular clusters as well, these compact balls of stars. And, uh, and those stars are um, uh, showing up in those, uh, those uh, globular clusters and they affect the way that the, uh, the globular cluster, both we find more information about the cluster and they affect the way that the cluster evolves too. So um, I hope you enjoyed this and uh, um, invite you to, uh, to uh, sign up, to uh, come up to the observatory and get to see some of these uh, yourself. Um, September 24th is uh, when we're doing the observatory, uh, observing lab this, uh, this year. And uh, as I said, when we do this, uh, we'll be um, uh, uh, bringing in the, uh, uh, our docents to, to uh, let you take a look at all of this and give yourself uh, a chance to uh, see all of these, uh, all of these beautiful objects except in our, our night sky. George, there Thank were you. a couple questions that um, I didn't ask during the presentation, but um, sure. The person who asked about the the uh, two dimensional um, view of the the planetary nebula asked a follow up question: Are we seeing the ring nebula straight on, whereby we see its white dwarf centered, whereby we're looking at the dumbbell nebula from the side and see the lobes? Um, I, I think that's a good guess. Uh, you know that that's uh, you know the you can imagine that um, it, if it's if it's more elliptical, you're definitely seeing something from the side, and the dumbbell is definitely something that we're seeing it from the side. The the gas is so uh, um, uh, wispy, so so, so uh, uh, not dense that you can you see through it. You can see the star through it. Um, but in the case of the ring nebula. Um, we're definitely seeing it through the, the, that blue part of it in the middle is much less dense than the edges of it. And so it does give you that feeling that you're, you're looking through the dumbbell end on from the ring. And somebody said, I imagine the Webb telescope will see more planetary nebula, nebula far out there. I imagine so. <laughs> Well, I think so, and I, in, I asked a couple of questions when we had our Webb Telescope uh, NASA um, guy on uh, this speaker series back in November um, about what the plans were for those images. And uh, yes, they are they are definitely interested in looking at planetary nebula because there's uh, you know the infrared views 
of <clears throat> planetary nebulas are going to pick up lots of dust as well as gas and that's going to give us a very new view into that and the instrumentation on the web has got everything that you could possibly want to do the kinds of tomographic uh, uh, studies that we saw here so I don't know if it's going to be first thing that they go looking for, but um, he said it was definitely on the list. And I, I believe those first images, I think they said were coming out May, G April, May timeframe, something like that. Um, yeah, that's right. Or, about six months after they uh, they get there, assuming all the calibrations go well, everything yeah. looks good so far. I saw a, a uh, an image uh, of uh, the first, the first, uh, the first light image, quote unquote, that, and it, it was an image of uh, one uh, one star, but it was, I think, eighteen images, one from every mirror that was slightly not quite registered yet. Oh. <clears throat> and we are hoping to do um, another another session in this speaker series with the uh, somebody from the Webb Telescope team. So. Stay tuned for that. A um, couple more questions. Is there, oh, is there a place where we can review your slides? I can answer that. Um, we do record all the speaker series presentations and we uh, put them on a, a special um, RFO speaker series YouTube channel. And the link to that is on our website, rfo.org. Um, I think it might be under events. You can go to the speaker series and, and um, the link to the YouTube channel is on there. So Give me a day or two to put them on, put put this on there, but you you'll find it there. Um, somebody asked, "What about carbon stars? How are they created, and where do they possibly fall within the star life cycle?" Um, I, I'm not an expert on that, uh, but I would you know the, essentially carbon is uh, um, one of the last elements that is uh, that is uh, formed in fusion um, from the uh, the time of uh, go, going through the series of of fusion uh, products and before it gets to iron. And, um, and so uh, the, the idea of a carbon star is that you're at, you're mostly carbon. Now, <clears throat> the fusion is, is not, um, it, it is not um, all at once through the whole core. Um, the, there are layers of fusion that are happening and it's at the very center of the core that it's gotten to the most dense um, uh, and heaviest elements. And, um, and, and what we're talking about when we talk about a, a, a particular element dominating in the center of that star is what temperature it's gonna be at that point. And so it's getting hotter at that point at, in the core, but it's starting to push the outer envelope of the star away, forming those, uh, those uh, red giant or orange giant uh, stars like Antares. Perfect, thank you. Um... Oh, uh, good question. Do we have ideas on what causes those gases to come out in an hourglass shape? No. <laughs> <laughs> just to be just to be clear, I mean, this is uh, but but knowing that it's an hourglass shape um, is what uh, piques the imagination of modelers and uh, theorists uh, to try and figure out an answer to that question. So, um, if you have ideas, um, uh, you're welcome to contribute <laughs> to. <laughs> To the science, that's definitely someplace where we've got uh, um, some uh, some some work still left to be done. For sure, <laughs> um, the person said, "I'll get on that." By the way, <laughs> oh yeah, um, Corey and Corey could. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Christy asked a quick question: Do stars ever collide? Um, they don't. Um, very much. In fact, um, when you uh, see a, a, they can, of course, but um, when you see a, two galaxies, for instance, colliding, um, the stars are so separated in galaxies, there's so much distance in between them that really what you're seeing is the, the, um, is the gravitational interaction of the stars and the way that um, the cores of the two galaxies disrupt the orbits of the stars and steal stars from one galaxy, the more massive uh, galaxy gets some of those stars. There's some beautiful um, uh, images of galaxies that are that you can see in a small telescope, uh, thinking up of uh, M81 and M82 in Ursa Major. Um, uh, one of those galaxies is uh, as a galaxy that uh, shows, it's actually two galaxies. You can see a trail of stars between them after they've passed through each other. Um, uh, M51 is another one of those up in Ursa Major. And so there's uh, 
uh, there's a number of galaxies that we can see that are distant from us, um, but you can see that they've been pulling each other apart. But it, it mostly the, the modeling shows that no stars will run into each other in there. Now, another place where stars might collide with each other are in the globular clusters. These are, um, it, there's about a uh, hundred of these in our galaxy and, um, and we see them in other galaxies as well. But if you could imagine the plane of the galaxy going across like this and the center of the galaxy being here, these globular clusters are, are spheres of stars, collections of stars of about 100,000 stars each that are in very vertical orbits around the center of the galaxy. They're not going around in the, in the same orbit as the rest of the stars in that, that, uh, that spiral shape. And so very interesting. They, are stars that were formed at the beginning of the of the uh, the galaxy's formation, and have persisted all this time. Um, and um, and so there's a lot of of uh, close passes inside of those globular clusters, and uh, and evolution of those is, but it, uh, similarly is more driven by close passes, not actual collisions, um, and uh, close passes where those stars uh, get together. And the last thing I'd like to say about that is that um, one of the the uh, the ways that stars do get together is when they are uh, in binary in orbit around each other. And um, what we just uh, in the last couple of years started seeing are evidence of gravitational waves from black holes coming together, orbiting around faster and faster and faster, closer and closer and closer until they merge. And it makes a huge disturbance in space time that we can detect with the LIGO um, uh, gravitational wave telescopes. So, so it's a long answer, but uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. Uh, and somebody just mentioned LIGO. They said, I've read that LIGO has detected gravitational waves from colliding neutron star black slash black holes. Would they more like, would they more likely to collide than fusing stars? Um, I, no, I think it's more likely that they're going to fuse stars together than to have a collision. Um, if you can imagine, uh, you know, how big space time is. Think about if you've been up to the, uh, the, the observatory in the park, we have a, a planet walk up there um, and you have a sign for the sun and, uh, and, and a sign for each of the planets here. And you have to walk a mile to get to um, the uh, planets in the outer solar system here. And if you think about these stars having cores in the 12 mile range, you can see that with the millions of miles of space around the star, that it would be a really amazing event for two stars to actually collide with each other. But a close pass is, uh, uh, is actually how um, uh, star stars in clusters are all in orbit around each other in very long orbits. And if they come close to each other, they, uh, the larger star will sit tight and the, the smaller star will get thrown completely out of the cluster. And, and so there's a, a, a evolutionary process in star clusters that um, is, is called evaporation. And the, the stars in the cluster start off to be a, a, a collection of hundreds of stars and end up just being tens, uh, dozens of stars because so many of them have been ejected from the cluster with that process. And by the way, George, I didn't read them all off, but a lot of people said thank you and that it was an excellent presentation <laughs> and that they learned a lot. So, um, and excellent. everybody. Um, Can I ask a question? Because I have a bad wrist and typing is hard right now. <laughs> of course. Ahead, I, actually have a, I have a litany of questions, but I'll keep it real short and fast because I know <laughs> there are a lot of people here. Uh, first one would be, you talked about the neutron star and how the protons and the electrons are fused, or yeah, if protons and electrons are fused together to create neutrons, right? Right. So I, I, I've heard before that gravity is the weakest of the um, uh, universal forces, um, but that means gravity is actually stronger than uh, like the strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, because it's actually combining these atomic elements together and keeping them together, right? Is that? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so that's a place in the universe where those forces are starting to get to parity with each other but it's a it's an unusual small corner of the universe wow uh okay number two uh 
you mentioned um, imaging software for layering images. Do you have a suggestion? Mm -hmm. Is there an open source, a freebie or something? Um, so certainly all the, any of the, 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 the Photoshop-like uh, products will work. So GIMP uh, in the open source world and uh, running on Linux. And uh, um, there are some uh, open source pieces out there as well. Um, there's also um, for doing imaging that you want to be able to use for science, there are specific um, uh, um, uh, softwares available out there um, for doing things like photometry and, uh, and spectro spectrometry. Um, so just, um, um, I, can, I can check in with you later, Ralph, and if you're interested in something like that, I can give you a list of uh, those applications. They I'd are not that. free generally. I just, I just got a 13 inch telescope, uh, Ooh. old Coulter light bucket, they call them, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I just renovated that, got it in my backyard and trying to having trouble collimating, but I'd love to play with it some more and get some advice from you. But if I may ask two more quick questions I, and I'll shut up. Uh, <laughs> uh, fusion, um, oh, did you see where they, they actually managed to do a five second fusion here on the earth? I think it was in Sweden, and the, and then now they're using talking about using AI to control the the process and they no, sustained no, it for five seconds. Wow, that's amazing. That's news. Fantastic. I that, no. Yeah, yeah, pretty cool. And then the last thing I want to end, m mention is I, I listened to the Space Nuts podcast. I don't know if any of you guys know that. Oh yeah, it's, it's great. <laughs> good guys. Uh, yeah, really good guys. And they were talking about light echoes and how you could have a supernova you know uh, uh, centuries ago and it would it, it would occur at that time the light would go out of course in 360 degrees whatever but some of that light would hit a dust cloud for example and 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 triangulate and then hit the earth much later and we would get a light echo from that original event and they can look at somehow look at they can look at that barcode of light and match it up to the original light. that's that's just like amazing stuff is that <laughs> i love that idea of a barcode of light um yeah basically they're looking at the spectral signature of the light because the radiation from those stars is going to have a unique uh, spectral um, signature and uh and i think we actually did some research here at rfo on one of our docents um who started as a docent as a volunteer at rfo um carlos um uh, as a kid, he started off as I he was maybe 11 or 10, something like that, when he started, stayed with it uh, through high school and uh, did some of this research in combination with some AVSO people, the Variable Star Organization. And, um, and he's uh, now working on his PhD in astrophysics. And so um, it's, a, it's a great story. And, uh, and it's one of the pieces of work he was contributing to that, doing observations from our our research telescope. Um, and uh, that's one of the things that you can do up at RFO as a volunteer. Thank you. Cool, thanks for the questions, Ralph. Well, I think if there right. weren't any other questions, just lots of thank yous. And I'm sure you all saw that George um, posted some, some links in the chat as well earlier. Um, you know, those two papers and uh, thank you all for coming I, it's been great seeing all of my my friends from uh, my past jobs and all of our rfo folks and so it's been a real pleasure thank you so much yeah thank great job george so, so we really thank enjoyed you. it yeah that was great <laughs> thank you thank you everybody. have a great have evening everybody. george good to see you okay bye. good to see you too okay bye-bye 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 <laughs>